first of all, I would like to thank Vietnam Lesbiology Society for giving me this opportunity. The topic of my talk today is fungal lung infections. There are several fungal pathogens that can cause respiratory tract infection, including yeast such as Cryptococcus, molds such as Aspergillus and Mucor, dimorphic fungi such as Histoplasma, and some of them are not able to culture. The example of this is Pneumocystis gyrovechiae. So the topics of my talk today will include only the most important fungal pathogen that cause lung infection, which are pulmonary aspergillosis, mucormycosis, and pulmonary cryptococcosis. I will talk about the update and uh, the management of these uh, infections. I will start with my uh, case scenario. This is a 68-year-old man having type 2 diabetes mellitus. He had kidney transplantation 16 years ago. The baseline kidney was 1.4. He is receiving immunosuppressive agent as shown. He was admitted at uh, our hospital with a upper respiratory tract infection and eventually COVID-19 uh, was diagnosed. He eventually had pneumonia with uh, oxygen saturation get down to 91% and the chest X-ray showed bilateral infiltration as shown in this slide. He received uh, antiviral favipiravir initially and changed to lemdesivir eventually. Dexamethasone intravenously and also brospectum antibiotic to treat the uh, uh, core infection with uh, bacterial pneumonia. However, he was intubated at day three after admission, uh, received hemoperfusion and ECMO about two weeks after admission. The chest X-ray progressed uh, as seen as uh, see in this slide, and you can see that the mass like infiltrate on the uh, left lung uh, and something look like the cavity of the lung. The chest CT scan showed uh, the nodule with ground glass opacity and some of the uh, area of the lung had the cavity. Serum galactomannan was sent and came back positive as 1.5. So in this patient, the diagnosis was COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis or CAPA. And therefore, voliconazole was started for treatment. So I would like to update the diagnosis and management of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. Nowadays, they are not only the classical risk factor for aspergillosis, but also the non-classical or novel risk factor exist. For example, patients who receive the small molecule kinase inhibitor for treatment of cancer are at risk for invasive aspergillosis, as well as patients with severe viral pneumonia, including influenza pneumonia or COVID-19 pneumonia, IEPA and CAPA respectively. So the diagnosis for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is now more challenging than before. On top of that, for treatment of COVID uh, or invasive aspergillosis, you need to consider the drug-drug interaction, the therapeutic drug monitoring for the triazo agent, and uh, the, nowadays we have a new ASO that may be able to use for treatment of invasive aspergillosis that with less drug interaction and broader spectrum. Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is the most common invasive mold infections of the lung. It caused by aspergillus fumigatus mainly, or sometimes can be caused by aspergillus flavus and other species. The classic risk factor includes neutropenia, 
or stem cell transplantation, corticosteroid use, or solid organ transplant uh, recipients. As I mentioned before, uh, there are emerging or novel uh, risk factors exist. So this risk factor includes the patient who receive a uh, biological agent, or those admitted in the ICU having severe influenza or small molecule kinase inhibitor, uh, in particular in blue tinib, or uh, receive other advanced cancer treatments such as CAR T cell. And nowadays, uh, COVID-19 is one of the risk factors as well. This slide shows uh, that the severe influenza is a, an independent risk factor of the invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. As you can see here, the median time uh, of influenza patient uh, to, to have the invasive aspergillosis was three days, which is quite fast. So we need to uh, think about the uh, aspergillosis um, early in this kind of patient. And the mortality rate was quite high, about 51%. Newly diagnosed uh, COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis should be um, con considered. The incidence of Kappa was about 19 to 33% in severe COVID-19 with the mortality rate about 64%. Uh, this patient lack of conventional risk factor of aspergillosis, but the risk factor of COVID-19 patients who have uh, aspergillosis uh, were those having ARDS on mechanical ventilator, receiving corticosteroid or interleukin-6 inhibitor. Of course, most common pathogen is aspergillus fumigatus. Voriconazole is still the drug of choice for treatment of CAPA, but must be careful about the drug-drug interaction uh, with the anti sarcov agent. This is the pathogenesis of aspergillosis. One, the patient inhales the spore of the aspergillus into the lung. The spore will germinate into the uh, hyphae and get into uh, the lung tissue and uh, invading the blood vessel. So the defin definite diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis required uh, tissue uh, histopathology obtained by bronchoscopy to see the septate hyphae uh, invading the lung tissue with some of the breathing or hemorrhage surrounding uh, the, the lesion. Therefore, in the CT scan of the chest, you will see the nodule and the halo side or ground glass opacity surrounding um, the, the lesion like this. Another tool for diagnosis is C-lung test or BAL, Bonco alveolar lavage test for galactomannan. And also the culture from the respiratory specimen will be helpful for diagnosis if biopsy uh, is not able to obtain. Uh, there are some suggestive lesions from the computer tomography of the chest uh, for invasive aspergillosis, including the ground glass halo sign, air crescent sign, or a nodule, or even the cavity. But none of this is 100% uh, specific for aspergillosis. However, in the non-neutropenic patient, the Im imaging from the CT scan may not uh, be specific or unique, uh, like uh, the, I just mentioned before. Sometimes in the non-neutropenic patient, you will see only a single nodular lesion or masses or bilateral infiltrate or diploid effusion. This is uh, not specific at all. And uh, the halo side and the air crescent side that I just mentioned is not common in non-neutropenic patients with the sensitivity only 5 to 24 percent. In the non-neutropenic patient, one of the useful size is vessel occlusion size or VOS. By using the high resolution 
CT with pulmonary angiography or CTPA. And you can see after injection of the contrast media, you can see the blood vessel stop here before uh, leaching the lesion, or you can see the uh, vessel occlusion side, the, the fragmentation of the blood vessel inside the lesion here. So this is uh, suggestive of the aspergillosis in non-neutropenic patients. That is, is useful. Uh, this example shows the CT scan of the lung in the kidney transplant recipient with invasive mole infection, uh, except this one. This is the psoas muscle, so the rest is a chest CT scan, and you can see the cavity here, here, and uh, the these three patients was uh, were diagnosed as pertilosis, and these two patients was uh, uh, mucomycosis. So I would like to emphasize that uh, the imaging of the lung is not specific to aspergillosis only, but also uh, can be caused by other mole infection, in particular mucomycosis. So serum galactomanan is really useful for diagnosis of aspergillosis, both serum and BAL galactomanan. In hematologic malignancy or neutropenic patient, the sensitivity and specific CT are as high as 7 to 80 percent, but the sensitivity decreases in a patient receiving more active agents such as itaconazole or uh, voliconazole. BAL galactomannan can be used in patients receiving more active agents because this agent would not interfere with the galactomannan in the bronco area lava fluid. Sigurgosilum galactomannan or BAL galactomannan more than 0.5 to 1, uh, depend on the guideline, uh, is diagnostic of aspergillosis. Or both serum galactomannan positive more than 0.7 or BAL galactomannan more than 0.8 uh, is also significant. However, this test is, has less sensitivity in non-neutropenic patients. Galactomannan can also be used for treatment monitoring. Uh, this slide shows to confirm that hematologic patients have a higher sensitivity and specificity uh, for serum galactomannan than the non-hematologic patient. So you can see the sensitivity getting lesser, 22%. 37% in non-neutropenic patient. However, BAL galactomannan is still quite useful with high sensitivity and specificity in both hematologic and non-hematologic patients. For the diagnosis of COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis or CAPA, uh, recently uh, they have a different uh, diagnostic criteria. For the proven, uh, we still need uh, the tissue diagnosis or the PCR from the tissue, but for probable kappa, so we require the imaging clinical risk factor, and the most important is the microbiology using the uh, serum or BAL galactomannan. This is uh, pretty much similar to the previously uh, criteria that I just mentioned with the cutoff 0.5 or 1. However, to perform the BAL in COVID-19 patient is challenging. So they have another criteria using a non-BAL galactomannan, such as tracheal suction. If the galactomannan in the non-BAL sample more than 4.5 for one time, so in COVID-19 patient, so this is diagnostic of a, a kappa, for example. What about the treatment of pulmonary aspergillosis? Recent guidelines recommend uh, voliconazole or isovuconazole, either one of these can be used as a drug of choice with the evidence of A1 for treatment of uh, invasive aspergillosis. And for choicine and other drugs can also be used. The ECC guideline also recommend isovuconazole and voliconazole as a first line as shown in this slide. So these are two drugs that can be used as a first line treatment. There are some limitations of voliconazole. First of all, this triazole 
has non-linear pharmacokinetics. So the concentrations of the blood level can vary up to 100 fold in patients receiving fixed dose of voliconazole. This drug reached the steady state in five to six days, uh, but if we use the loading dose, it can reach the steady state as 24 hours. So if possible, we require TDM or therapeutic drug monitoring for voliconazole. Voliconazole has uh, hepatotoxicity, CNS toxicity, toxicity, and prolonged QT, so must be used with caution in some patients. It has significant drug interaction, uh, while the, uh, the CYP2C19 and CYP3A4 as mentioned here, and the uh, IV form of voliconazole uh, should not be used in patients with renal insufficiency because of the cyclodextrin solution in the IV form. Okay. And voliconazole uh, has activity against aspergillus only, but not the mucormycosis. So compared to the isovoconazole here, there are some difference between two drugs. So for example, cyclodextrin uh, in the IV form uh, is not used in the ice for isovoconazole. So that's why the, this can be used in patients with renal insufficiency. Isovoconazole had activity against mucormycosis, and both of them uh, was approved for first-line treatment for aspergillosis. The pharmacokinetic of voliconazole is non-linear, but isovoconazole is linear with less drug interaction and less adverse effect, and therefore therapeutic drug monitoring at the moment is recommended for voliconazole but not isovoconazole. So next, I would like to move to the mucormycosis. I just start with this case scenario with a 50-year-old man post kidney transplantation for six weeks, coming with lung cavity like this and the biopsy of the lung glue mucor. This example of pulmonary mucormycosis. This is another one, uh, mucormycosis. Uh, in a woman uh, post kidney transplantation, uh, this uh, patient underwent lobectomy and the uh, specimen grew Cunningham Miller Bertoletti. This is a young uh, man uh, uh, previously healthy with a car accident with the drowning. He aspirated uh, water into his lung and eventually he developed multiple airfield cavity in the lung and have the uh, scattered multifocal consolidation in all segments, both lungs. The tracheal suction glue both aspergillus and the mucor uh, pathogen. Uh, in this case, it, uh, they were uh, lysopus and lictimia. Here, as shown in this slide. So, uh, this is the scenario of the pulmonary mucormycosis. Uh, there are uh, about 9 to 10 genus of mucolalis that can cause mucormycosis, and the most common pathogen is rhizopus. What is the predisposing factor of the mucor? Diabetes, of course hematologic malignancy, bone marrow transplant, neutropenia, and so on. Uh, but there are three uh, risk factors that most likely cause pulmonary form of mucormycosis, which, were, uh, which are bone marrow transplantation, corticosteroid, and solid organ. The patient with diabetes are most likely having the uh, rhinocerebral mucormycosis. Uh, diagnosis of mucormycosis is challenging because aspergillosis and mucormycosis share similar clinical and radiological presentations, but cultures in patients with mucormycosis usually negative. Antigen tests such as galactomannan uh, for aspergillus is not useful, can, uh, is not diagnostic for mucormycosis, so we require a high index of suspicious. So in the patient with prolonged acidosis in poorly controlled DM, renal failure, receiving immunosuppressive, something like this with a lung lesion, we need to uh, perform some diagnostic procedure. Biopsy is the 
uh, in the best one, but sometimes it's not easy. Um, for the susceptible tibo host of Aspergillus and Nuco are pretty much the same. Most of these pathogens can cause disease in hematological patients and other risk factor. Even in COVID-19, uh, is still uh, the risk factor of Nuco are uh, COVID-19 associated mycosis or CAMP. And you can see here the histopathology of this both pathogen is different. You can see Aspergillus is shown by septate hyphae, but mucor is non-septate hyphae. And one of the uh, useful tools is the CT scan. Some of the experts describe that mucor may have the reverse halo side, which is the opposite of the halo side here. And you can see the gallblast opacity inside the the, the consolidation, uh, which is in the opposite of the halo side. However, this is not part of pneumonia. The therapeutic approach for mycosis requires multimodal approach, which are equally important. First of all, we need to give the patient antifungal agent. The drug of choice is liposomal and for tercine B. Once the patient is getting better, we can um, de-escalate the antifungal to posaconazole or isoconazole. Surgical debridement is also very, very important. And collection of the underlying disease, control diabetes, uh, discontinue or reduce the dose of corticosteroid or immunosuppressive drug also really important it as part of treatment of mucormycosis. Now I would like to move to the last pathogen, cryptococcus, that causes cryptococcosis. We are familiar with CNS cryptococcosis, but what about the pulmonary cryptococcosis? Uh, cryptococcus exists in the three halos or the bird dropping. Once the patient inhales the spore or the desiccated yeast cell into the lung, uh, can, that can cause the pulmonary cryptococcosis. And in the severely immunocompromised patient, the cryptococcus can be disseminated to the brain that causes cryptococcal meningitis. So the clinical presentation of cryptococcosis includes cryptococcal meningoencephalitis, pulmonary cryptococcosis, that the most two common. The risk factor, including HIV with CD4 less than 100, or those receiving immunosuppressive agent or organ transplantation. So there are two species of cryptococcus that cause uh, <coughs> disease in human. Cryptococcus neoformin and Cryptococcus gatii. C neoformins mainly cause disease in immunocompromised individuals, but C gatii can cause infection in immunocompetent. The difference is that C neoformin is likely to cause CNS disease rather than lung disease, whereas C gatii most likely cause pulmonary cryptococcosis rather than. Uh, cryptococcal meningitis. CKTI uh, has a less susceptibility to fluconazole and the treatment is more difficult that can cause the cryptococcoma that sometimes require surgical intervention uh, to remove the cryptococcoma and may require a prolonged antifungal treatment. This is the example of my one of my patients who have pulmonary cryptococcosis in H, a non-HIV patient. This is a young man come uh, admitted to the hospital with uh, community acquired pneumonia and his sputum show encapsulated budding yeast and the culture grew C cati and eventually we performed the molecular type and it came back with G2 molecular typing. This is a 70 year old non-HIV woman um, admitted with the multiple uh, mass in the lung and firstly the provisional diagnosis was uh, met lung metastasis from cancer but it turned out to be pulmonary cryptococcosis with serum cryptococcal antigen positive with 132. And this is a 24 year old female having even syndrome treated with prednisolone 40 mg per day and other immunosuppressive agent admitted with fever, cough, and hemoptysis for three weeks with the lung 
infiltration on the left middle lung field and blood culture and sputum cultures also grew cryptococcus more form and so this case the, the agnosis was pulmonary cryptococcus. So there are some difference between the cryptococcus in HIV and non-HIV patient. Uh, this is a study to compare uh, both diseases. You can see here that HIV negative patients are more likely to have the lung involvement rather than the HIV positive patients. Uh, similar to this, uh, our study that show that in an HIV negative patient, uh, the percentage of pulmonary involvement was uh, 34% compared with 2.7% in HIV uh, positive patient. This is the opposite to the CNS involvement which you will see more in the HIV positive patient. So uh, in a patient with pulmonary cryptococcus are most likely to occur in non-HIV patient. This is uh, one of our study showing that cryptococcus in non-HIV patient uh, is associated with an uh, autoimmune disease that we call anti-GMCSF, autoantibody syndrome. And you can see here we have uh, these 14 patients and seven with a positive anti-GMCSF and seven with negative anti-GMCSF. And uh, pulmonary involvement was five in those with anti-GMCSF positive and three from seven in those with negative and the anti-GMCSF. In the patient with positive anti-GMCSF, uh, they are more likely to have disseminated disease and the CNS disease and a higher mortality. The treatment of uh, pulmonary cryptococcus require antifungal treatment with fluconazole. Uh, which is different from meningitis. In cryptomeningitis, we normally uh, start with the induction and for tercin B and for cytosine for at least seven days before uh, changing to fluconazole. But in uh, pulmonary cryptococcus, we can start with fluconazole without induction uh, with and for tercin B. However, in a severe uh, symptom uh, patient or uh, immunocompromised patient, uh, the treatment would be the same as in this disease with the uh, amphotericin B induction for about one or two weeks before uh, the escalate to fluconazole. In conclusion, a common fungal pathogen of the respiratory tract includes Aspergillus, pneumocystis, mucoronis, and cryptococcus. Pulmonary aspergillosis, mucormycosis, and other mold infections share similar clinical features and require diagnostic procedures. Novel risk factors for aspergillosis are emerging, including severe viral pneumonia, such as influenza and COVID-19. Pulmonary cryptococcus may occur in apparently immunocompetent hosts. Thank you very much.